Evet tekrar hoş geldiniz. İkinci bölümde aramıza katılanlara da. Welcome back to our second session and I'd like to welcome the new guests as well. We'll continue with Lazo Fold and I'll introduce him briefly. Lazo Foldi has been involved in European youth policies and youth studies for more than 20 years. Starting from the beginning of 90s when he was studying at university he was a volunteer in the National Youth Council and he was the vice president in charge of European studies. Since 1996 he was in the uh, Hungarian government's National Youth Service and in 1998 he started working in the same service as the European Development Director. Until 2009 he was the head of the agency of youth programs of European Union and since 2000 he has been working as a consultant and a lecturer. He worked in 27 different international projects as a trainer, consultant and director. And he's been working for the No Hate Speech Movement as well for the European Council, uh, Council of Europe. And for Council of Europe, between 2004 and 5, he was a training consultant. And between 2012 and 2013, he was a project coordinator. Since 2011, he is the contracted external expert for the No Hate Speech Movement of the Council of Europe. Last of all, they will talk about the relationship of hate speech and international rights, and he will talk about the importance of fighting against hate speech. Then he'll talk about the effects of democracy on internet, and he will explain uh, the scope of the project he's involved in at the Council of Europe. Laszlo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Very first, I would like uh, to say hello to all of you. It's very nice that so many people are interested in this very strange topic that we are discussing, the hate speech. But before I would like to talk about hate speech itself, I would like to show you a video. Can we have a uh, sound as well? 2013, June.
I don't have to comment this uh, video, I think it talks about itself. We talk about hate speech, which is a very complicated and complex phenomenon. In order to understand it, I would like to give you some hints of how to grasp it. What I will talk about is first definitions, different definitions of hate speech and its relation to freedom of speech, the roots and dimensions of hate speech, the manifestations of hate speech, the impacts on young people and consequences, and combating hate speech, how we can combat it. The scientific definition goes as follows. It's from Rafael Cohen Amalgor from 2011. Hate speech is defined as a bias-motivated, hostile, malicious speech aimed at a person or a group of people because of some of their actual or perceived innate characteristics. It expresses discriminatory, intimidating, disapproving, antagonistic, and or prejudicial attitudes towards those characteristics which include gender identity, race, religion, ethnicity, color, national origin, disability, or sexual orientation. Hate speech is intended to injure, dehumanize, harass, intimidate, debase, degrade, and victimize the targeted groups, and to foment ins insensitivity and brutality against them. I also show you a political definition. This political definition was created in 1997 by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, which incorporates 47 countries in Europe, including Turkey. The term hate speech shall be understood as covering all forms of expression which spread, incite, promote, or justify racial hatred, xenophobia, anti-Semitism or other forms of hatred based on intolerance, including blah, blah, blah. As you see, the difference between the two definitions, that the scientific definition is less, uh, is less full of taboos, while the political definition is more political in terms of this, this could have been achieved in the present European context. Okay? because laws are defined by politicians. Anyway, what we can see, there is a common understanding at the moment of what hate speech is in the European context. Uh, how many of you know the court, the European Court of Human Rights that is in Strasbourg? Have you heard of it? Can you raise your hands? So, it's very well known. There is a court where people can bring their cases if they are, for example, targeted by hate speech. There are many different cases going on in this court of human rights. So the court of human rights also had to come up with certain solutions how to assess hate speech from which we can learn, because when we talk about hate speech in our local context, it's easier to understand whether something is hate speech, hate speech or not. That's the biggest challenge. As we heard also from Elizabeth, sometimes it's very difficult to justify, to evaluate whether what is happening is actually hate speech or not. In the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it states everyone shall have the right to hold opinions without interference and everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive and impart information and ideas of all kind, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing or in print, in the form of art or through any other media of his choice. This article also says that the exercise of these rights carries special duties 
and responsibilities. Nobody talks about it. I liked very much, Elizabeth talked about it in one of her slides, that freedom of expression goes with responsibilities of the individuals as well. And may therefore be subject to certain restrictions when necessary for respect of the rights or reputation of others or for the protection of national security or a public order. This later sentence was put there by representatives of countries, by politicians. Of course, it has certain uh, political implications. Why it is there to talk about national security or public order and of public health and morals. I don't want to go into details of what it can imply, but it can, it can be used for the good, but it can also be used for the bad, like most of the laws and most of the things that human beings create, including, for example, the atomic power. In public speaking, there are six basic elements, often expressed as who is saying it, what is being said, to whom it is said, through what medium it is said, with what effects, and for what purpose. This is how the communication science examines communication and speech. To a group of people, structured, deliberate, and manner intended. This is the public speech. Public speech is given to a group of people where there is a space that many people can access. We say that the online space is a public space because it has access by many people. Of course, it's different if you chat with a friend of yours in a private room that's probably cannot be considered as public. But since we know that the internet can be traced in different ways, anything that goes there remains there, and what remains there can be searched by anybody else. So we have to bear in mind that the internet itself, as a whole, should be considered as a public space. Just a little eye candy. How does the Council of Europe, the European Court of Human Rights, assess hate speech? When they see your case, they examine the following. Who says it, which is recently becoming very important, because it's not the same if I'm a priest, for example, and say something in front of a mass, or if I'm just an individual among my group, among my friends on the internet, on Facebook or somewhere else. Or if I'm a politician, or if I'm a scientist in a university, or if I'm speaking to a big crowd in a university. It's not the same power. What is the content? What is being said? What is the tone, the style, the, the characteristics that is given to the speech? How serious, how humorous, how scientific, how uh, less serious it is? What is the context? In what kind of situation it is being said? And what is very important, what are the targets of that speech? if you talk about hate speech, and who are those people, what are, the what are the potential implications, what it may entail on the short term or the long term. Does it invite people to commit illegal things? Does it just invite people to think something about some other people? To what extent is it dangerous? To what extent can it have an implication which can have a result as a, a hate crime, for example? And what is the intention of the person? For example, if I say a sentence here in this context, I say uh, a sentence about Roma people, in order to give you an idea of what hate speech can be, that of course this sentence cannot be taken out from this context and taken to the court of human rights or to court in Turkey 
uh, to sue me that I was actually delivering hate speech because my intention was to educate on the contrary about hate speech. What are the roots? Because hate speech itself is only the, the symptom. It's only the manifestation of something else. You could see the pictures, you could see the anger, you could see the emotions. And as we say in pedagogy uh, and in education, that we never argue emotions because emotions are emotions and arguments are arguments. So if I feel bad or if I have a fear, if somebody tells me, don't fear Laszlo, it will not go away <laughs> because it's not rational, it's emotional. And hate speech is full of emotions. Those people who actually deliver these in intentions, these uh, acts, because speech is an act itself, they have certain emotions which comes from somewhere, from fear, from experience, from uh, history, from their parents, from their teachers, from their politicians, some, something that they take over from, from somewhere. The roots of this can be racism, can be Semitism, xenophobia, can be gender identity, can be LGBT issues, like sexual orientation, uh, religions, politics, ideology, or physical characteristics of people. Where do they happen? Everyday life, we don't have to look for the internet. You can all search in your own memory that you have already about situations where you were targeted or you were targeting others. We all do that. It's not something that is, uh, that is uh, out there because we simplify things in our lives in order to make things easier. And it's much easier to think that there are good people and bad people, there are things that are black, there are things that are white. But I can tell you, I traveled in the last 25 years in Europe, all around, and I have never seen any community which is homogeneous. It does not exist. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's maybe a wish of, uh, of humans to have a very homogeneous uh, society, but it doesn't exist. And I don't think it will ever exist because we are all different and because people speak different languages, they behave differently, they have different cultures. In every country that I visited, there were different people living different languages. If from here, when I grew up, I thought Germany was like the big country with Germans and with very clear directions and they are very efficient. And when I go there, it's, they are just like us human beings with all kinds of people around. People who don't speak German, people who speak German, people who were brought up there, people who speak certain minority languages in the different regions. Uh, and it's the same in my country. You think Hungary is one uh, uniform country? It's not. We have many minorities, many different people living there. Within the country, there are dialects and people don't understand sometimes each other what they say. They behave differently. We have prejudices against a, in a town in the East because we think that they behave differently, etc., etc. We all have these kind of things. In media, you can find it. Uh, we had some discussions already with, uh, with Elizabeth about the responsibility of the media, the printed and the, the visual media. Politics is doing it all the time because they need to manipulate, because they want to win, they want to stay in power, they want to get into power, so they have to use all the possibilities of manipulating people by their identity. That's the easiest and the best way to deal with people, is to touch their identity. Because we all have that, and we, it's very, very important for us. And if people touch it, we become emotional, because we think we identify with our identity. But, but after all, we never have to forget that we are human beings, primarily. And we tend to forget that somehow, everywhere in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in America, people tend to forget this very simple, 
very important fact. Governmental structures are, do, are doing it, institutions. In schools, young people are learning it very quickly through bullying, either online or offline bullying. They copy basically what they see in the adult society. They try to do the same patterns. If a young child is growing up in a nursery school together with Roma people in my country, for them it's very natural. They, they, it is research that shows they are not becoming racists. They are becoming racists if the image that is built up in them at the young age is negative because they don't have experience. And it, I think it works everywhere the same way. In Turkey, in Hungary, in France, everywhere. The social science is very dangerous. Sometimes they themselves try to actually prove things which go in line with, I don't know, superiority or history is trying to tell us all kinds of things which you can believe or not because history I would say is fairy tales. Some of them are facts, but many of the parts of history are constructed now based on the memory and the facts that we have. I don't say that it's not a science, I'm saying that it is something that can be very easily manipulated. Uh, just a little uh, statistics from 2009 from the OECD report. These are the different uh, motivations or motives of recorded hate crime in Europe. In the first place, you see race, ethnicity, and religion is quite high, 34, 35, 35. And uh, the second, I would put uh, gender, sexual orientation, and other. When we talk about online hate speech, we cannot differentiate between any tools or any uh, forums because you can find it everywhere. So there is no such a place where you can find hate speech. You, you find it everywhere because it's part of the communication. In websites, in social media, in blogs, in emails, in memes, in games, there are lots of games which actually teach young people to hate. You can shoot uh, Muslims, for example, in certain games, or you can, uh, I don't know, eliminate Roma people from communities in certain strategy games and these kind of things. They are dangerous because they are games. They seem to be har uh, not harmful, harmless, but actually what they teach implicitly is very, very bad on the long term. And of course, videos and chat rooms. The impacts on young people. I would like to draw your attention to the video that I showed you. It's from 2013, from Europe. It was uh, recorded in Macedonia, in Skopje. And uh, if you remember the, the scenes, the people who were throwing the stones and were aggressing that uh, office of the local LGBT community, they were all young people. Pardon? And men. That's another observation. I didn't want to bring that into the attention now, but yes. They were all young boys. So the impact on young people. On one hand, internet is a learning space for young people. It's a very good learning space. We shouldn't close it down because it has a lot of good potentials. And it, should, and it should remain free. But it's very easy to learn things from the internet, especially they are easy black and white patterns. Because young people are at the age of looking for identities, looking for things that are certain, because you are leaving your family so you need values and ideas that you believe in, that you think that will, you can hold yourself to for the rest of your life. This is the characteristics of that age. 
So young people are especially endangered by these ideologies and ideas because they can buy them very easily. If you sell hatred or black and white things, people buy it easily. But if you sell human rights or talk about dignity of people or the complexity of life or the diversity of humans, it's very difficult. The human brain prefers easy solutions. As easy as that. And there are many emotional risks for young people that they cannot deal with it. So they can very easily become recruited by these ideas online if you don't pay attention. What if they become the victims? Because they are sensitive, they have a sensitive identity, they have a sensitive personality, of course they are much higher risk. You could see, you could read that some people committed suicide because of bullying. Some people committed suicide because of not being accepted in a community. Because it's a very important time of the life of a human being when they are young to belong somewhere, to have friends, to create the first networks that you have in your life. The emotional and psychological harm is very, very big. The social harm that it can have is immense. The physical harm that can happen is also very, very risky. And the possibility of suicide is there. The consequences of antipated hate speech is bullying, for example, in schools or in youth communities, uh, verbal aggression, physical aggression, hate crimes, murder, suicide, and war. How can we combat? As we said, we don't want to erase the freedom of speech, because that should not be the idea. If we believe in democracy and if we believe in human rights, that's not the idea to make the, the internet a censored place which can be, at the end, used against anybody. So the responsibility of young people and the responsibility of citizens is much higher than ever. If you take a look at the European tendencies, uh, extremism is reborning now in every country. Every society, they don't have a memory of what happened in the beginning of the last century in Europe. They don't remember, they don't have memories of fascism, they don't have memories of World War I and World War II. So it will be very easily reborning. So if we do not educate the upcoming generations about the consequences of hate and how to deal with the hate in you, because we all have that, then it is very likely that we are going backwards in history, which is historians can say that that's the way it goes. <laughs> but anyway, we should do everything we can do. That's what the Council of Europe thinks, and that's what those young people think who actually initiated this campaign called No Hate Speech Movement, which I will talk about in a minute. So monitoring and research is very important. To collect data and information, to, to research it in a scientific and academic way, to teach people about the facts concerning hate speech, the statistics, the implications, the, the occurrence, and everything around it, receiving and investigating complaints, to have a structure in each country which are de dealing with, for example, reports or dealing with victims who were victims of hate speech or hate crime. We have to work with internet service providers, uh, less with governments because governments can... Uh, Governments, the power should not control the internet. That's, that's what the Council of Europe thinks, and that's what we think. But internet providers can have safety regulations in terms of keeping the internet safe for people. They can be involved. Those companies who are actually providing the internet in every country. Education, training, and awareness raising, I think that's 
that's the easiest thing we can do, and that's what the campaign is doing. Public campaigns, local, national, and international campaigns, victim supports and community building, international cooperation and legal measures. At the moment, there is no legal agreement in Europe concerning hate crime and hate speech either. Somebody told me that hate speech and hate, hate crime is in Turkish, it's the same. Is it true? No. Okay. Online solutions. This I Okay. Out. I would like to take your attention a little bit more. Oh, the campaign, yes, it's here. Hate speech can target anyone. Hate speech may be anonymous, but its victims are real. It affects all of us. In Tokyo, the English job, yeah, you sound with a smile on your face. Hate discriminates. Words, pictures, music. The wall of hate is the wall of shame. Online hate speech strikes us from behind our screens. Я наслышан об этих вещах от друзей, от знакомых. Также слышно по новостям передают часто, что есть много людей, которых достают угрозами по, по сети, например, в Facebook или в чатах. I've encountered hate speech many, many times, especially probably because of my identity as a person. I identify as a transgender woman. And Hate speech is really obvious towards transgender people, especially online. And I've encountered a lot of a lot of bad hate speech towards transgender people. Alors moi j'ai reçu des menaces parce que étant noir africain, il y a un monsieur qui m'a dit moi je déteste les noirs et si je te voyais à l'université je te brûlerai vive. In internet think that when whatever they say it won't be punished because we are not in the real life we are in internet and nobody can take the responsibility what was said but it's not the uh, right way to act Fala kaisema i pederashi Jam kai nai su karte va chare pederashi a goleba seko te da borbas soi ka te pala e kana istano istano istano People need to realize how dangerous and how serious hate speech is because people think, oh, I'm just writing some comment online. But there could be someone that that was the push. Someone was pushed over the edge. And hate speech causes people to commit suicide. Hate speech causes hate crime. Hate crime causes murders. It's, it's like a snowball effect. I felt really offended, but at the same time, I didn't want to escalate and to put myself in a situation where I, you know, start like responding and this kind of stuff. So I decided to totally ignore this thing. In a shukar, kana tu mene ko to do pe slike te tu mene pisin go pederashi go dilo gom go kai do pe bulane bul nai go shukar nai tu mene shukar nai na to to ven na pisaren svarta po Facebook. Moi, je, je donnerais un conseil à tous ceux qui euh, ont subi ces épisodes de, de, de, de, de haine. Je leur demanderais de ne pas se démoraliser. Donc, c'est un univers ouvert à tout le monde. Et je pense que aussi, donc, ça doit être restructuré, organisé, donc, dans le but que les personnes puissent sauvegarder leur, leur dignité. Je pense que si les gens commencent à se battre contre la haine, 
it will really kind of spread and it will probably be stamped out altogether. Je pense qu'il n'y a pas vraiment une conscience sur, euh, sur le, ces discours de haine et que justement euh, cette campagne a pour but en fait de promouvoir ce, ce discours contre la haine et de, et de surtout de sensibiliser les jeunes. When we see for instance uh, hate speech online, uh, people mobilize against it and speak out against it. I think the, the most important thing is to mobilize in particular young people to take part in, uh, in the discussion going on uh, online. Ciao, je m'appelle Mort, donc je soutiens les droits de l'homme en ligne. Hi, I am Nathalie and I stand for human rights online. I stand for human rights online. No Hate Speech Movement is a campaign against fear by the Council of Europe. It's a campaign for young people who want to stop discrimination and hate speech online. Join our movement. Taking action is important, easy and urgent. Share photos or videos about what you think about hate speech. Upload it through a social medium. Share your story, leave your message of solidarity, speak up for free speech and against hate speech. Report hate speech content to Hate Speech Watch and become an online human rights defender. Join discussions with other young people and claim your right for an internet free from fear. We stand for a web in which freedom and dignity of all human beings are respected. Join the No Hate Speech movement today. This told you what the movement is about, basically, but I would like to give you some more hints about what it is. Okay, the original idea was to have the campaign called Hate Me or Hate Me Too, which was a very interesting provocation, but uh, at the end of the day it remained no hate speech movement, which is more politically correct and less provocative. Uh, maybe in, the, in 10 years' time, Europe will be ready to also deal with a campaign called Hate Me Too, but this time we started with no hate speech movement. In, in the animated version of the logo, as you could see in the video, and if you see the online uh, manifestations of the campaign, we still keep uh, in the animated logo the Hate Me question mark and the Hate Me, in order to, have a, to, to keep it somewhere there. Because the original idea was to, to invite young people to, to say, hate me too because I am white, or hate me too because I'm uh, straight, or hate me too because I'm gay, etc., etc. To, to, to, to create an atmosphere in which these features, these, these characteristics, became ridiculous, in a sense, that people start to laugh a little bit instead of hating. So how we work with the online campaign? Uh, this is a new way of campaigning because the online is the online word where one click is one second and people do not spend more than 10-15 seconds in looking at a screen. So we have to be very smart and very, uh, very attention catching or eye catching. So uh, we use fa Facebook. We have a Facebook page. At the moment we have 6,000 followers which was growing in the last four months, uh, and the tendency of growing is quite steep. So now we are getting about 50 new likes every day. So the, the tendency is quite uh, steep at the moment. We also use Twitter. We use the landing page, which I will show you. And of course, we use the different uh, uh, uh, video host uh, portals like YouTube and Vimeo. And we also have a blog. How it works, we have uh, basically uh, a 
community of self-expressions. We invite young people to express themselves by uploading a photo or a video or an image that they like about hate speech. This is more about engaging young people to actually think about what it is or think over what hate speech is. Uh, at the moment on the, on the uh, landing page, we have close to 700 uh, uploaded media after four months. Uh, we have a community uh, in a hate speech watch, which is a kind of database of different hate speeches in Europe. Uh, people can upload reports of hate speech from anywhere in the internet, from blogs, from, hate from Facebook itself, from Twitter, from uh, uh, static sites, from any parts of the internet, also games and videos. We have at the moment uh, about uh, 300 uploaded reports which can be searched in the European context. Of course, these hate speech reports are in different languages because that's the challenge of the European campaign is that hate speech functions in different languages. So we have to be multilingual. However, the web page is English and French at the moment, but the reports are also in Turkish, in Hungarian, in French, in Czech, in Russian, etc., etc. But we encourage the national campaigns to run their own websites the Bulgarians, the, the Serbians, the Slovaks, uh, the, the Finnish, for example, they all have their own website and they also deal with their own national hate speech content there. And that's the aim, actually, because the European campaign is only to, to bring, to create a kind of European atmosphere around the campaign so people can get involved. But it actually, the actions should happen on the national level because also, the legislation is on the national level. So if some, something goes to the direction of removing content, that can also only happen in the national context because there is no European legal construction for doing such a thing. Uh, and we have a community of moderators. Uh, we have about, at the moment, 150 online volunteers that we work with. Uh, including some people from Turkey as well that we are going to meet next week. We will have a training for them, the second training for the online activists. And uh, with these people, we actually plan the different online actions. This is the landing page, the hate speech movement. Uh, in order to re register uh, a report, or in order to report a hate speech content, you have to be registered. In order to upload a media, you don't have to be registered. Okay? And those who moderate the website are young activists. They are the volunteers who actually validate, for example, reports in the back end of the site. This is the hate speech watch. I'm not going into details. Uh, every month since May, we have a so-called European Action Day. The Action Day is a kind of focus on one day of the year. For example, uh, last week was uh, the European uh, Local Democracy Week, which was a celebration of local democracy all around Europe, organized by the Council of Europe and the 47 member states, including Turkey. And we had an Action Week to promote uh, combating hate speech in the local communities with different actions. And for each action day, we design the logo a little bit differently. We play with it with the online volunteers to, to have a little fun and to make it more interesting. We had a refugee day in June. We had an LGBT day uh, in May. We had a, a day, the 22nd of July, uh, in memory of the Otoya massacre. We had an action day for that, and we also invited people to sign up a petition to make the 22nd of July as a European day uh, for victims of hate crime. These are the different action days that we had so far. The next action day will be the 9th of November on the day of action against uh, fascism and anti-Semitism, and we will have the last action day this year on the 10th of December on the day of human, International Human Rights Day with different actions. What actions we do on these action days and around the action days, and of course out of the action days as well, is we ask people to join the events on different online media, social media. 
we upload photos, we ask them to upload photos and videos connected to that specific action day or to that specific target group that we are focusing on. Uh, we ask them to report hate speech connected to that topic. We ask them to make videos and video messages. We ask them to sign petitions sometimes. We ask them to send message or comment uh, with a certain uh, comment form all around European websites. We ask them to post, share, and promote, and tweet. We also organize sometimes thunderclaps. Do you know what thunderclap is? No? If you are interested, it's a very interesting tool. You have to type thunderclap.it, and you will understand what it is. It's really great. It's a, it's a social online tool to campaign for certain causes. And also, we ask them to, to do artistic expressions, to design images, to to design memes, for example. In offline world, we ask young people to organize flash mobs in the local context. You all know what flash mobs are. Create guerrilla art street. The last time we tried it, to, we asked people to actually write no hate, no hate. Uh, what was it? I don't know the slogan, I don't remember. We had a slogan that we asked them to actually paint it on the streets. Like when the, you have elections and sometimes parties who are not so rich, they actually use the pavement. To, which actually disappears after some weeks because of the rain and because of the weather. Uh, we ask the different graffiti actions. Uh, we ask them to talk to politicians or to send emails to politicians. Talk to other young people or to wear certain clothes or badges on different days. The tools that we have, uh, we have a report tool bookmark which can be used. Anybody can put on, their br on your browser a little bookmark. So if you, if you find hate speech online somewhere, then you just click on it and it immediately brings you to the report page. So it makes it even easier. We have the same thing, the report tool code for websites. So if you have a website, for example, the, the foundation website could have this uh, report tool code so that those who visit the website, they can very easily click on it and go to the hate speech watch if they find something. We also use banners with other. We have, of course, uh, the Council of Europe is producing these things. Of course, in the European context, the number that they produce, some thousands, are very going out very rapidly. So we invite the national campaign committees to produce their own gadgets and badges and T-shirts and things like that. But uh, in, in the last four months of the campaign, the first four months of the campaign, this is growing rapidly. You can already find bags all around sometimes and T-shirts and caps. And it's going to be all around us in a year, I think. We have three educational tools that are in development. And the one which is coming out first is the number three, is the online campaign package for schools. This will be available from uh, the beginning of November. It can be downloaded and it can be used in uh, secondary schools mainly. The other two will also come out by the end of the year. I think that's enough for the moment. I was thinking also to show you the page, but you can browse yourself. I think that's easy. I don't have to go. You see the, the hate speech watch is here. The join the movement is here with the different uh, pictures. This one is very funny. It was uploaded, I think, yesterday from Macedonia. This is cool. There are some very interesting photos if you look around with the photos. And that is, this is the blog. The blog is basically a kind of newspaper that we use to, to incorporate different information and articles a Slovakian example of how to combat uh, hatred against Roma people in a local context. We organize debates. Uh, yeah, you can read the blogs in English and in French as well, because it's bilingual. And recently, we tr started to use online debates. We had the first test last week, actually, during the local democracy week. We had three discussion forums. One was, if they are elected by people, they can say whatever they like. We talked about politicians and their responsibility. It was very interesting. So the website is for you to use. It's not a website to, use, to be used by the Council of Europe. It's a website to be used by young people. 
So you can also join the, the activists if you want. You can find us on Facebook. It's called uh, uh, No Hate Speech Action Group, if you are interested. There is also an open group which is called Combating Hate Speech. That is open. We have at the moment 1,300 members there. And we have the website, the web page as well, the, the Facebook page called No Hate Speech Movement. Thank you very much. Evet, şimdi sorulara geçebiliriz. Konuşmacılarımıza soru. We'll move on with the questions now if you'd like to ask questions to the speakers. Do we have a hand mic? Here. Um, I need to ask that um, as a young person, um, I'm trying to struggle with the hate speeches in the family. Like, how can I change the ideas of my family, for example, about the Kurdish people, homosexuals? So, you were talking about young per people and saying that they, are, they were doing the action. And then I realized that. It is different for many ways for my friends and especially for me. So do you have any suggestions for me? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can tell my own examples in my own family, but <laughs> I, will not like, I wouldn't like to bore with you. Uh, I'm kind of successful with my mother, but with my father I'm not so successful. <laughs> Uh, but they changed since I'm uh, arguing all the time and trying to bring other perspectives. Of course, they change, or at least they don't do it when I'm there. <laughs> I don't know what they do when I'm not there. So, uh, I think the only thing we can do is to argue, online or offline, argue, to, to, to give counter-arguments and ask questions. I think especially if somebody is very, very extreme in terms of thinking. The best thing if you ask questions. I had once a very interesting story. I go to the gym uh, every week and there was a guy in the dressing room who I, you know, in the dressing room you start talking, blah, blah, blah. And, and he started to come up with this extremely racist, anti-Roma, uh, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, I mean, I'm Do I have to do anything here? I'm, I'm not working in the gym. <laughs> I mean, do I have to come up with my human rights side? And, and then I started asking questions. And, and actually, we reached to a point where the guy started thinking like, oh my God, what, what am I saying? Because we ended up with eliminating Roma people in Hungary. That was the end. Like, we should actually kill them all. That's what he said. And, I, and, I, and then I asked Beth, like, you really want to kill these people? And then he said, oh, no, no, I don't. No, I don't. And then, I mean, this is only one example. This is also dangerous to go into this direction. But argumentation is very important. Uh, I'd like to add to what Laszlo said that um, I have a, I've lived for a long time, so I remember when the first gay people came out of the closet in Norway in the early 1970s. And I think, uh, I mean, the recipe for acceptance is that some people have to go first and be courageous. And that is, of course, a big thing to ask of some people, because it is dangerous. But if it's not done, you're, you're achieving nothing. And, but I think also uh, what you also hinted to in your uh, speech, Laszlo, is uh, reproved by research in my country, which is that if you live among people of other inclinations, be they sexual, be they ethnic, whatever they be, you have the experience, well, they might be say that about people, but it doesn't apply to my neighbor. I mean, once you get the experience of uh, having friends who are gay, who are uh, transgender, who are uh, uh, Bosnians, who are uh, Gambians, whatever, I mean, 
you you think differently because you're having the human close relationship. That's why people who hate so much, they are afraid of humanism, as uh, Anders Bering Breivik, he said that humanism was so bad, he wanted to oppose humanism. He thought of it as a naive way of dealing with people. I think exactly the opposite. And I think uh, to show that we're all human beings and that love is universal and that love takes different paths, but it, it can be slow if it's a very traditional society. And I've been to Iraqi Kurdistan uh, a couple of times, and I know that the gender issue there is very tough. So uh, it might be an uphill struggle for some time, but things are changing all across the world and also in people's places where tradition rules strongly. They are much more affected now by the positive sides of globalization than they were two decades ago. Still add something. I was in Baku uh, three or four weeks ago, having a workshop on hate speech, um, because the, in Azerbaijan they start the campaign also. The National Youth Council has started the campaign, and of course there is this taboo there not to talk about the Armenian and Azer Azeri conflict. And I was pushing it like really hard. <laughs> I was like, I'm a foreigner. I can say whatever I can want. So. In the workshop, I mean, not in the plenary session, <laughs> but in the workshop with about 25 people, mm -hmm. with men, with women, it was a mixed uh, construction with older and younger. And I started to push this out a little bit very carefully. We had two hours, and at the end of the, the, the two hours, we actually, st we actually started talking about the things in a more open and honest way. Because at the beginning, it's only the cliches that were coming out, the cliches. The things that people think that they should say. Because everybody else says it, so in order to belong, I should say the same. Because all the people around me say that this, if I want to belong and be part of this community, which is very important to me, I say what they want. And it takes time until they got into an atmosphere of trust, and atmosphere of understanding, and that the fact that we are living in a much more complex uh, world than cliches and stereotypes, when we started actually to talk about personal experience. Mm. And that's when the whole thing started. That's when things started to move, when, when, when I turned the mirror to them, like, okay, let's not talk about Armenians because they are not here. Let's talk about you. What do you feel? Why do you feel it? What experience do you have? Where is it coming from? How can you deal with it? Look into the mirror first and then say anything about the others. It's slow, but you can do it. I don't know how you can do it with your mother and father or brothers and sisters, but you can do it. It's not impossible. With lots of love and understanding, first of all. Yeah. First of all, thank you for coming here and my question is to Mr. Foley. You said that internet and games is... Uh, in internet and games hate speech occurs uh, sometimes, but uh, didn't the young generation know that most of the internet and games are fiction? Or uh, I think without some uh, weak characters they can differentiate what is fiction and what's real? Or do you think they can't differentiate it? What do you think about it? What I can, what it reminds me, uh, your question, is the good old debate of some scientists and uh, communication mm -hmm. specialists that the internet is virtual or real. I mean, nowadays, most of the, the people who, who actually research the internet, they say that the, the, the internet is real. It's part of the life. It's not virtual. It's not fiction. It, it is. We are online. I mean, I don't know how much you are online, but if you count how many hours you are online per day, it's shocking. Like 10 years ago, there was no internet, and now pe some people spend six, seven, eight hours online, or even more with the mobile phones. So what is virtual, what is fiction online, is, of course, a game is a fiction because you take part in a game, but the patterns 
that you learn there are real. The, the patterns can actually reinforce hate attitude if you actually have to shoot Romas in a, in a game. That is clearly gypsy people. It's like, just think about it. And of course, it, it looks harmf harmless, but it's what, it, what, it, uh, what the hidden learning uh, potential of this game is very dangerous. Of course, some individuals can handle that and say, okay, it's just a game. But some young people are much more vulnerable than that, uh, depending on their intellectual and emotional uh, intelligence. If I could add to that, even if I wasn't asked, uh, I've had this discussion with my son, who's probably around your age. And uh, I think you're right in saying that we shouldn't underestimate young people's ability to distinguish those games from reality. But on the other hand, research has proven what Laszlo just said, that people who are uh, from the start vulnerable, who have lived, for example, grown up in a hostile family with mistreatment, maybe with violence, they are uh, proven to be more prone to let this affect their emotional life and their actual deeds. And uh, one very prominent example that I didn't mention in this aspect, that is uh, the uh, terrorist in Norway. For the last year, before he did his very planned terror, he was playing these war games, the worst of the war games, actually, uh, constantly. He was grooming himself through. I mean, he was conscious that he was doing this because it would make it easier for him to assassinate all these young people. It was a deliberate move from his side. And I don't say that that applies to other people than him. And he was vulnerable because he grew up in a family with a bad family relations and with a... So he had psychiatric problems too. So what I, my answer to your question would be there's never one factor behind a hate deed. There are always several factors. But these games might, in some cases, with vulnerable individuals, uh, function as part of an explanation. That's my point of view. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so my question will be about uh, about how to fight hate speech. I mean, mm. if our ways of fighting with hate speech are, uh, you know, efficient. Uh, and today, actually, we talked about uh, hate speech in terms of, uh, like, in, in an individual basis, in terms of emotions, but. Uh, actually, in last year's panel, uh, we said that uh, hate speech is uh, is not about emotions, actually, but maybe on an individual basis, yes, it is. But uh, it's not that all journalists hate uh, these minorities. They, they they they produce hate speech in order to keep their positions in the hierarchy. Uh, so, and I want to give an example. If I was working in the Hunting Foundation and hate speech project, uh, and we prepare reports and we expose hate speech in the in the main in the media uh, and you know um, and like we make graphs like what newspaper produces the highest uh, highest uh, frequency of hate speech and uh, you know there was this one newspaper a very, very extreme right wing uh, newspaper that made a headline like we were the first we came first in the <laughs> you know in, in the hate speech uh, mm -hmm. you know competition and, and we are proud uh, to <laughs> to be that. so so when I saw that headline, I thought like, are we doing um, are we doing something efficient or are we just strengthening the, their positions? Are we by like these, um, uh, these uh, having these young people combating against hate speech? Are we just empowering uh, the the the enmity between the uh, maybe the two groups, the human rights groups and uh, those hate? Mm. And I will so Thank you. Is it on? Yes, it is on. Um, your question is uh, is very uh, relevant, but uh, my answer first would be: What is the alternative to rise up against it? Is to be quiet about it. And I think in Norway, for example, we've tested that in a, to a certain extent because uh, the right wing extremism was below the radar, not only of the surveillance people, but also of the ordinary people. And uh, we face some consequences of that. Uh, the thing is then perhaps also, uh, I mean, the individual and group thing, I think that Laszlo and I have been so harmoniously agreeing on everything, but I was partly disagreeing on something you said, so maybe that could be brought up. That is when you talked about the roots. 
And of course, you talk about race, you talk about ethnicity, and you talk about xenophobia and all this. But there's also another question that we haven't mentioned yet, and that is that in the whole of Europe, and I guess also in Turkey, we have a huge economic crisis now. We have lots of unemployment, and we have lots of people who are now sort of getting disabled from being functioning citizens by having a job and by being able to uh, provide for themselves. And this in itself makes a lot more people vulnerable. And I think that is a sort of collective issue. And I know if you listen to Charles' husband last year, he's very concerned with group rights and collectivities. So I guess uh, that is part of the answer. Uh, the other part, I think, is uh, was shown, I think there was a TV program, I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was about uh, a Swedish uh, ladies, and it's much about women being harassed sometimes, and also Anders Bering Breivik, he was very hostile to, to women and feminists particularly. And this was a, a lady who had criticized uh, Hennes and Mauritz for some uh, ads that they had made, this uh, worldwide uh, textile chain uh, or fashion chain. And she got so much hatred back from that, surprisingly much. But then some of the reporters who made this documentary, they went knocking on doors of some of the people they found who had actually harassed her. And they would then say, oh, you know, I didn't mean that seriously. I mean, there's something with the net. It's so easy. You can be drunk. You can just study what comes in at 4 o'clock in the morning and what comes in at 1 p.m. too. No, 1 a.m. also. And there's a difference between what comes in then and what comes at, uh, let's say, 10 a.m. So it's something with the easiness. And when you confront these people, they would maybe regret and they would maybe made to think twice next time. So the confrontation in a sort of gentle, questioning manner might be one of the methodologies with individuals, but with groups. I think we have in Norway some rather extreme Islamist groups too. And I've been to one of the forums where some, uh, some preacher they had invited said that, well, we don't allow music. Well, this is music, by the way. <laughs> uh, and then I, I was there not because I'm a Muslim. I'm uh, not believing in, uh, I believe in humanity. But uh, I then asked him, well, a few days ago we had this singing, because this was a conference of these people uh, dedicated uh, to the 22nd of July victims, so to say. And I said, well, two days ago, a lot of people were standing in uh, the square singing a non-hate song about the children of the rainbow to uh, oppose Bering Breivik, who had attacked precisely that song for being naive, multiculturalist, blah, blah, you know. So was that bad music? And uh, the, the preacher, who's uh, Abdurrahim, uh, something green, yes, he's from Britain, he's a traveling, uh, rather extreme Islamist. He, he was, uh, well, you say, if you start with one drink, you're going to be an alcoholic. That was his argument against music also, you know. So, But, I mean, you have to meet them also on the collective arenas. And uh, some people are very clever at doing that. I'm not myself, but I think we need to do that also. And do it in a gentle way, questioning way because it might lead to more questioning among them also. I don't think there is anything to add. You agree with me on the crisis then? No, no, no. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, my name is Elif, I'm from BNS website. I would like to ask two questions actually. It's both about the combating the hate speech. The first thing is law enforcement, uh, because the, uh, as Ms. Uh, Ms. Seide told in your uh, speech, you said that uh, right now, uh, regarding all these laws, would be a false message to the minorities who are discriminated. Uh, beyond that, what kind of a law enforcement can, wor uh, can work on hate speech uh, when we are thinking about the freedom of speech and freedom of press? Because um, I just want to give some examples. Uh, when our in our country the democratic the democratic package uh, has been released by our prime minister, uh, there was a very uh, pro-government newspaper uh, made a new made a cover, uh, new cover say says that from now is it uh, wrong to say an Armen uh, Armenian that he is an Armenian? One of the uh, cover was that. Another example is that uh, just like. Uh, a few months ago, one of our uh, music uh, pianists, Fazal Sai, probably you are familiar with the story, uh, he is uh, found, found guilty and uh, prison for 10 months for uh, not blasphemy, but 
discriminating some of the people, uh, p the, uh, some of the people in the society and their religion just because tweeting some kind of a uh, poem, Omar um, Hayam's poem. I'm sorry. By Rumi, was it? Omar um, Hayam. Oh, Hayam. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So, what is the limits and what is the position of the law enforcement when it comes to the hate speech? The second one that I want to ask to you, actually, Mr. Foley, and it's about the, that you mentioned on your speech that uh, the combating to hate speech, we should work with the internet service companies, but not with the, not maybe maybe not with the government. Uh, I would like to learn what kind of methods that you're suggesting, maybe. And not just specifically, but um, as a path because, uh, for example, uh, right now in some in the issue of the freedom uh, freedom of internet and free internet of discussions, uh, they always say that the problem of the freedom of speech and the internet and freedom of uh, freedom of blog is because that the governments and the also internet service companies are censoring internet because of uh, in the name of against of child pornography, against of hate speech, etc. And we saw some kind of examples like on Facebook, because I can give, um, for example, Facebook has deleted one of my uh, photographs that uh, there were some women with uh, bare breasts photograph because they, uh, they called it as uh, nudity. But also they are deleting in the same reason because discriminating of the uh, women, they are deleting the photographs of uh, including pornography or uh, discriminating and discriminating women too. So what is the method when we're regarding the, uh, we're thinking of the freedom of speech and freedom of blog, um, the limits of the cooperation with internet service companies and the governments when it comes to speech online? Thank you. First down. Well, I wouldn't like to say that we, we mustn't work with governments. <laughs> what I'm saying is that uh, in terms of making laws, there is always the danger of misusing laws. That's as simple as that. And the logic of power is very different from the logic of humanity, usually. Because, uh, because it's a completely different logic. Because people want to be re-elected in every four or five or six years. They want to stay in power. If they get into power, they want to keep it. That's the logic. So of course, uh, the interest, when, when you put the whole issue in, in, into, the, into the norm system of interests, then, then we completely lose the focus. Then we cannot talk about what hate speech, what human rights, what other things, because interests are interests and values are values. That's not something that they can compete with each other. Uh, so I think the danger of, uh, of having laws that actually censor the, the internet or, or speech is, is a double edge tool, I would say. Uh, so we have to be very cautious with that, especially uh, nowadays in, in Europe, because there is a very clear tendency of going extreme. Uh, but on the other hand, there must be some, some legal instruments. Uh, what I can tell you, there is, a, there is a law in Hungary about hate speech. It hasn't been misused yet, but it doesn't mean it will not be. Uh, but the problem with this is that there are some internet content that can be removed due to this law. But because the internet is not respecting uh, borders, they can just move the content to the United States, for example, and then immediately it cannot be removed. So there is an extreme right-wing blog in Hungarian that is hosted in the United States, which means that the, the, the Hungarian law cannot do anything, because if there is no agreement between the United States and Hungary in terms of dealing with this issue, and there is not because in the United States the freedom of speech is high dominating everything, so it is not possible to remove it. Uh, but I completely agree with the danger of legal instruments in this direction. I heard that there is also preparation in, in Turkey of this, uh, mm. of this law. So, but it's, when it becomes political, then it's another, it's, it's, a, it's another field of expertise. I'm not a politician, and I don't want to be a politician. Same here. Um, 
the uh, Umar Kayam uh, is a very uh, intriguing example, to say the least. And um, well, as for Norway, we have uh, laws against child pornography, and people who surf and download child pornography are actually sentenced, and I think uh, they should be. So that's my personal opinion on that. I mean, there is uh, some limits when it comes to hurting others uh, who are more, much more vulnerable than yourself. But then, I think, on the other hand, blasphemy laws, for example. I've seen how they work in Pakistan, as one example, where you can just say in a local community about your neighbor, well, my neighbor stepped on the Holy Quran, and that will mean that the neighbor was arrested by the local police and is uh, sitting for an indefinite time in prison and sentenced by a local court, later might be uh, pardoned by a higher court, but in the meantime, the person might be killed in prison by incitement to violence within the prison. So, I mean, this is highly, I mean, blasphemy law is highly dangerous, I think, because it's used in so many bad ways. Um, when it comes to the our artic article on racism, much of the critique has been actually we should remove it because it is never put into practice, just in the utmost extreme examples of people who want, for example, to sterilize people who are adopted from other races. <laughs> and you mean, such people have been, have been sentenced, but uh, others have not. There have been other cases, but they've been dismissed. So, so uh, the discourse on that article is twofold. It's the people who think it would be wrong to remove it because it gives the wrong signal to vulnerable minorities, and it's the people who say we should remove it. Uh, oh, we should remove it because it is um, against free expression, or because it hasn't been used efficiently. So, um, but there's the one more thing. The first thing you said about oh, are we not allowed to say this and that? It's something funny with that formulation because I think in these discourses there's one thing we haven't touched and that is how certain, often powerful people, but not only powerful people, are positioning themselves as victims. Oh, am I not allowed to say this and that? And Well, I've, been, I've not been published, I haven't had access. And the victim position can be a powerful position, it can be a source of power for the society. <laughs> I mean, if you pose yourself as a victim to enhance certain politics, and I've seen that happening in my country, I think it happens elsewhere too, actually. Uh, I think also some parts of the Article 19, this the dignity of the nation or the dignity of society, have been misused in many countries. Last but not least, there are many countries, uh, also uh, in Tunisia after the spring, Arab Spring, they discussed whether they should have a press law or not. And I discussed it with uh, the guy who was actually out doing some work on this, Kamel Labidi. And I said, well, in Norway we don't have a press law as such. We have laws about ownership so that the whole press shouldn't be Murdochized, uh, being owned by one company. Uh, should be a 30% uh, ceiling. But to have a press law can entail a lot of curbing of the free media. So I think it's better to have the self-regulatory bodies as the, we have in several countries. They don't always work so well, I know that, but then we have to improve them. So the same uh, answer. Okay. Yeah, I didn't talk about service providers. That was another question. Uh, there are some uh, good practices and some practices around uh, connected to the no hate speech movement and also to the civil society movement. Uh, I mean, we don't promote and there is no practice when we ask service providers to decide on things because that's not the issue. But in involving them means that, for example, in certain cases when it is very clear that there is a, there is a website, so case by case, I mean, then civil society, for example, wrote uh, uh, a letter together to, the, to that actual service provider where the hate content was hosted or where, where, where, uh, where we, they also involved uh, internet service provider in the debate on the national level, for example, in how to, how to combat hate speech and how not to. So they have a say there. And the third thing is that it's possible to, to invite them to also write guidelines for their services on, on what kind of uh, values or in what way they give the service. So at least there is a kind of hint from their side to those who use the internet. Uh, in terms of hate speech and uh, the dangers, the safety issues. Sometimes these can go to the safety 
regulations or safety issues. Sometimes it's, it goes into the general conditions. It depends. But uh, absolutely not inviting them to decide whether a content is good or not. Bir soru daha alacağız. Sonra bitirmemiz gerekiyor. One last question, then we have to conclude. Um, I will ask another question. For example, I'm seeing some of my friends sharing uh, some things on the Remembrance Days, like Srebrenica, Holocaust, and then I, I realized that they are divided. Like, if you're remembering Srebrenica, you cannot talk about Holocaust, or like Jewish people. So, how can we explain that these are the same in a humanistic way? So, it's a really hard problem because they are humanistic in their own way, but not really. So <laughs> could I make myself clear? Thank you. I'd like to uh, start answering by reference to a film. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but Alain Brigand, a French producer, he produced uh, 11 films about 9-11 in the year 2002. He invited filmmakers from all over the, well, from many parts of the world. The only guideline was that each film should be 11 minutes and nine seconds. And they all were. And one was made by a Bosnian filmmaker. And it was about how they had a rally every day to commemorate the victims. And, uh, but after 9-11, some people said no. And it was almost the same day, it was just after. I said, no, we can't do this. But then in the end, they marched. Uh, and uh, another film was from uh, Iran, where Afghan refugee children had a very hard time understanding what this was about. And the only way the teacher could sort of equal these uh, twin towers in New York to what they had as their experience was looking at the chimney of a brick kiln, which was outside in the refugee camp. But these children were far more concerned with the local uh, two men who had fallen into a well there and were discussing, did they die or did they not die? They could not imagine what happened elsewhere. That is one of the problems of human psyche, I think, that we have to work with through history. And I think history then becomes important. I think it has been maybe to the annoyance of some people living elsewhere than in Europe that, for example, the large-scale killings of African people, not particularly in Congo, but also in Namibia and other countries, have been not commemorated to a large extent compared to the Jewish Holocaust. And I think that is part of the problem, that some people felt left out of this Holocaust paradigm, which has been very prominent. It should be there always, I think. To the Europeans, it still is a massive, important thing to remember, and Holocaust deniers should be opposed. But uh, I think it is part of an inclusive policy to include more of history than the Holocaust in uh, 1445. And I think it's a, it's a challenge for Eurocentric thinking people to do that in a good way. So it's not only about uh, the Balkans, it's about, uh, well, it's about Libya. During the Second World War, just before that, 250,000 people st were starved to death by Italian concentration camp leaders. Uh, El Agela is the name. Nobody's heard about it, practically, because it's not part of what we include in the history of mankind. And I think to include more parts of the ugliness of imperialism, if you like, and fascism uh, is very necessary for us not to have this, no, I have my Holocaust, you have yours. Panelin sonuna geldik. Hepinize değerli katkılarınız için çok teşekkürler ama en büyük teşekkür tabii... Well, thank you very much for your contribution and the biggest thanks go to Laszlo and Elizabeth because they came all the way from their countries and they shared their experiences with us. We can continue our conversations outside around the coffee. Thank you. <gülüyor>